Sounds good. Actually, yeah, I'll be back in a second. So I was getting some more. Oh, you, you're all good. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the ninth annual MSU Science Festival, an annual celebration of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Um, my name is Catherine. I'm going to be your host today. And today we're joined by Dr. Elias Eide from MSU. Hi, Elias. How are you? Hi, Catherine. I'm really good. Thank you for having me tonight. Glad to have you. Um, just a couple notes for everyone before we get started. If you're joining us on Zoom on the webinar, um, please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions throughout the presentation. We'll be sure to get to them at the end. Um, if you're joining us on the Facebook Live, I'm monitoring the comments section, so feel free to ask your questions there, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation as well. Um, so without further ado, uh, go ahead and begin if you're ready. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, thank you again, and thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. So as you can see in the title of my talk today, uh, tonight the talk will be about our ancestors. And uh, no, it's not going to be a biology talk, it's going to be an astronomy talk. And uh, later throughout the talk, you'll understand why I chose our ancestors as a title for my talk. But before starting any, uh, any talk about astronomy, I usually, uh, like to introduce three, three scales or uh, parameters, three cosmic scales uh, that uh, are a bit different in the universe and the cosmos than what we are used to in our daily life. So these three scales are distance, numbers, and time, and starting with the distance. So uh, if we want to talk about the distances in our solar system, for example, so this is an artistic impression of our solar system, of course, of course, neither uh, sizes nor distances are to scale. This is just an artistic impression. But for example, the distance between the Earth and our sun is around 150 million kilometers. And this is just like very short distance in, in the universe, of course. And you can see that we already started uh, quoting numbers that are really large. We're talking about 150 million kilometers or 93 million miles. And because of how large this number is, astronomers like to call it one astronomical unit just to save time and effort. And we are still in our solar system. So let's make a trip and go to the nearest star to us. The nearest star to us is Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri can only be seen from the Southern Hemisphere. We cannot see it from the Northern Hemisphere. And it is at a distance of 4.2 light years away from us. You can see now we have stopped using miles and we are or astronomical units and we are using a new unit called light years. And uh, light year is a measure of distance. It's not a measure of time. It is the distance traveled by light during one year. So light is the fastest distance, fastest speed we know of, uh, 300,000 kilometer each second. It takes around 4.2 years to reach us from Proxima Centauri. And of course, if you want to express this distance per miles or kilometers, the, distance, the number is going to be really huge. It's like very difficult to comprehend. So when I say that Proxima Centauri is 4.2 light years, in other words, also we can, uh, you can think about it in a way that if you have a ship that can travel in the speed of light, you need around four years to reach Proxima Centauri. And I know it's impossible to, try and to travel in the speed of light. And also, if we want to think of it, about it in a different way, if we are looking now at Proxima Centauri, the light that is, uh, we are receiving right now uh, would have uh, left Proxima Centauri around four years ago. So every time we are looking at this star or other stars in the, in the universe, we are looking at the past of these stars and vice versa. Let's, for example, assume that there is some intelligent civilization on one planet around Proxima Centauri, and indeed there is a system of planets around Proxima Centauri. And let's say there is some hypothetical intelligent civilization on one of these planets, and they have really large telescope, 
very very large, uh, much larger than the one we have in this in, in 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 this cartoon, and they are looking at Earth right now. What they will see right now is not a planet ridden with a pandemic that is crippling this planet, and where they're not going to see a global population suffering with with with, with a current pandemic. However, what they will see right now is our planet. And also, of course, they won't see like people walking on the streets with, with masks and everything and like shops are closed, restaurants are closed. What they will see right now is our planet, how it was in 2017, four years ago, living in La La Land, not aware of the great danger that is waiting for us with a global pandemic that is going to cripple the planet. And this is right now, of course. And of course, this applies to every star in the, in, the, in the galaxy and in the universe. So every time we are looking at these stars, we are looking at the past of these stars. And also, if there's some like intelligent civilization around one of these stars, when they look at the Earth, they will see the past of our planet. And therefore, let's make the same experiment now, but with a star that is around 51.4 light years away from us. Why this particular the particular distance, because uh, if there's a, a, an intelligent civilization on a star that is 51.4 light years away from us with a giant telescope and looking at our planet, they will see how planet was 51.4 years ago, which means this will bring them back to the exact date of the 20th of July, 1969. And instead of pointing their hypothetical giant telescope towards our planet, if they point this telescope towards the moon, they will be able to see right now the crew of Apollo 11 putting the first human step on the lunar surface. So basically they will be able to see the lunar landing live right now. If they can record it and send the video to us, which we'll receive in 51 years from now, they will be able to debunk all the conspiracy theories about the lunar landing. Now our galaxy uh, stars, this is again an artistic impression of our galaxy. We cannot take photos for, of our galaxy because we live inside of it. So this is what we think our galaxy look, looks like. And our galaxy is 100,000 light years across in diameter, which means if you want to travel from one side of the galaxy to the other, in a spaceship that can travel in the speed of light, you need 100,000 years to go from one side of the galaxy to the other. Of course, we are still in our galaxy, but hey, let's make a trip to the nearest galaxy to us, which is Andromeda. Andromeda is at a distance of 2.5 million light years away from us. This is a really large number, and this is just the nearest galaxy to us. Again, if we want to make the same experiment, and let's say there is an intelligent civilization with a very, 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 very large telescope, and this intelligent civilization is using this telescope to look at our galaxy, more precisely to look at our planet Earth. What they will see is how our planet was 2.5 million years ago, which means right now, they won't see any of us intelligent human controlling this planet and polluting it and causing a lot of problems to other animals. But that they will see right now is this. It's called Homo habilis, one of the early ancestors of the Homo sapiens, the new humans. And uh, it was roaming Earth, or like more precisely the eastern uh, coast, uh, the eastern side of the African continent, around 2.5 million years ago. So that's what they will see right now if they look at Earth from the nearest galaxy to us. They say that a photo is worth a thousand words or a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, definitely now I'm going to show you a photo that is worth all what I've just said, which could also have saved me all the previous slides to try to explain to you how large is this universe is. So what the team responsible for the NASA Hubble Space Telescope did is that they pointed the Hubble telescope towards a very small patch of the sky. You can see in this rectangle, this is the small patch in the sky relative to the size of a full moon. It's a very small uh, uh, patch, not much stars, quite dark. 
And they pointed the space to the Hubble Space Telescopes for several weeks, collecting images and images and images. And after several weeks of collecting data and combining all these images, this is what they got. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And every dot in this photo is a galaxy on its own. Some are larger, some are smaller than our Milky Way. Some of them are at billions of light years away. All these galaxies in this very small patch of the sky. Of the sky. And for me and for a lot of people, maybe this is one of the most influential photos ever taken or photographs ever taken because it, it, it shows us how big is the universe that we are living in. This universe, or what we call the observable universe, the universe that we can see, is expected to be around 93 billion light years across. This is billion with a B. This is how large the observable universe. Why I'm saying the observable universe? Because the universe might be even much larger. It's just that it is not old enough for the light from very these very distant galaxies has managed to reach us yet. This is how large our observable universe is. Now we're going to talk a little bit about numbers, and you already saw that the numbers are are, are really astronomical in, in, in the universe. And uh, starting with our Milky Way again, this is our Milky Way galaxy. It contains around 200 billion stars other than our sun. So our sun is not unique. There's another 200 billion star in our galaxy alone, similar to our sun, some larger, some smaller. And in the universe or the observable universe, there are around 100 billion galaxies. Some are smaller, some are, some are bigger than our Milky Way galaxy. So if you want to get a rough estimate about the number of stars in our galaxy, in our universe, sorry, we'll have to multiply 100 billion, which is one followed by 11 zeros, times 100 billion, which is one followed by 11 zero. And the number that we will get is one followed by 22 zeros. I don't know what is this number called. It might have a name, but this is how many stars there are, a rough estimate of the number of stars in the observable universe. So yes, definitely we are not unique and our sun is definitely not unique at all. So when it comes to time, the average lifetime of a human being is around 80 years. But this is less than a fraction of a second compared to the time scales in the universe. For example, a star like our sun, our sun has been around for about 4.5 billion years, again with a B. And we expect that our sun will live for another 5 billion years before it start dying. Don't worry about it, we won't be here. But uh, this is the age of a star like our sun. We're talking time scales of billions of years. The universe has been around for 13.7 billion years since the Big Bang. And uh, you can see that the numbers are really large when talking about the ages and time in the universe. It's actually very difficult to comprehend this time, the, 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 these time scales. And as I said, the talk title tonight is Our Ancestors. And if you ask, for example, as a, a biologist, if you ask a biologist, who are the direct ancestors of our species? Uh, this is what they will show you the images of Homo sapiens or whichever been before Homo sapiens, which we descended from the early, uh, either the early great apes or later the Homo habilis and all the Homo family to Homo sapiens. And this is the story that you will hear from a biologist. However, if you ask me as an astrophysicist, who are our ancestors or what are our ancestors? I will show you a picture like this tell you the stars are our ancestors. Why? Well, I hope I can convince you by the end of the talk. But when the universe started with a, with a Big Bang, uh, it was a massive, uh, there might be some sound in this video or no? Okay, that's good. I hope you don't hear the sound in the video. Anyway, so when the video started, when the Big Bang started with an inflation and started expanding at, at really massive speeds. 
and the universe started expanding. It was initially made, like the universe was initially made of a soup of uh, of subatomic particles, and then atoms started to form. And most of these atoms were hydrogen around seventy percent, and then helium around thirty percent. So the the universe was made primarily from hydrogen and helium. So where did all the other elements in the universe and are the basic ingredient of life, like carbon and oxygen and all the other elements that we know of in the periodic table, where did they come from? Well, short answer is they were forged inside the stars. So when a star was born from a giant cloud of gas and dust, and here I'm showing the life cycle of stars, dividing them into two groups. The group that we we're going to call sun-like stars, which have a mass similar to our sun, and then group which are called massive stars, which have mass maybe eight times or 10 times the mass of our sun. And we're going to see that they have different evolution or different evolutionary track, but we'll get to that. But when these stars are formed from this giant cloud of gas and dust, uh, the, 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 the cloud collapses un, under its own gravity and becomes very, very hot in the center. And when it becomes very hot in the center, the temperature will be very high that the star will be able to fuse hydrogen atoms into helium atom. This nuclear fusion reaction releases a massive amount of energy. And it is the energy that we receive from the sun on daily basis and give us the warm here on earth. We don't get much of it here in Michigan, but I mean, in general. And uh, 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 it is this, this nuclear fusion reaction what keeps the star, any star stable because we have the forces of gravity pushing inward. And then we have this energy that is coming from this nuclear reaction from this engine inside of the star pushing outward. And the star will live in this stable, the star like our sun will live in this like uh, stable uh, fashion for an extended period of time or most of the, the, the time of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the life of the star. And for example, our sun, since it's burst from a giant cloud of gas and dust that collapsed under its own gravity, it's been fusing hydrogen in its core into helium for around 4.5 billion years. And it will continue to do that for another 8 billion years or like 5 billion years, but won't do this in the, in the, fan, uh, in, in, in the sorry, it won't do this infinitely. And then because at some point the star, like our sun, will run out of its fuel and there will be no more hydrogen in the center, It'll be mostly helium. And because of that, the star will stop the nuclear fusion for a little bit of time and the atmosphere of the star will start puffing up. So the star turned into what we call a red giant, become very large. It will swallow the inner planets like Earth and uh, Mars and, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Earth, Mars and uh, Venus and Mercury. So most of the uh, inner planet might be swallowed by this puff up uh, of the atmosphere of the star. And inside the core, because there were no more fusion, the force of gravity lead the core to collapse even further and start fusing the helium into heavier elements like carbon and oxygen. So here are some of the elements, the heavier elements that we see in the periodic table other than hydrogen and helium started to form in the universe. Now, what happens to the star is after fusing high carbon, uh, helium into carbon and oxygen, the star is not big enough to start fusing carbon and oxygen to heavier, even heavier elements. And what happens is that the star will lose its outer layers and then the remaining core will turn into something that we call a white dwarf. So here's a video showing uh, what happens. Uh, Catherine, can you hear the 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 audio in the video or no? Nope, no audio, just the video. Okay, let me try now. 
the deep, cold reaches of the solar system, flying in toward the sun, passing the orbits of Neptune and the binary pair Pluto and Charon. We are seeing our home system as it may look about five billion years from now. Looking closely, we see that something's gone dramatically wrong with the sun. Its fuel supply running low, our star now swells in size, becoming a red giant, engulfing the orbits of Mercury, Venus, and our Earth. The sun now goes unstable and puffs off shells of plasma and gas, eventually hurling outwards the components of what will become an immense fluorescent nebula for all the galaxy to see. What remains of the sun now shrinks down to become a dense, cold, white dwarf star, the lonely cinder of the former planet Mars as its closest companion. So, so this was the dramatic ending of a star like our sun. During this process, the star first fused hydrogen into helium and then helium into carbon and oxygen, but it did not form a lot of heavy elements other than that, and then ended up in a wide world. So it's a dramatic ending, but it is not as dramatic as massive stars, stars that have a mass eight times and more than the mass of the sun. For these star, the evolution is even much more dramatic. But similar to our, star, our sun, this star will form from a giant cloud of gas and dust, which collapse under its own gravity and start burning hydrogen into helium. But massive stars tend to burn fuel at a much faster rate. So live fast, die young. So after they run out of the fuel, it could be only a few hundred million years instead of billion years like our sun. And once they run out of this fuel, they turn into something called a red supergiant instead of a red giant. Red supergiants are really large. Here's an example of some of the famous red supergiants in the, in the galaxy, like Antares and Betelgeuse. And you can see the size of these two stars in comparison to the sun. Yes, the sun is this small dot on the left bottom side of the, of the photo. So these stars are really massive, really large, and their atmosphere is puffed up, of course. Betelgeuse is a very famous one, and you can see it with the naked eye, of course. It is in the constellation of Orion. Uh, you can see it is under the armpit of this warrior, because Betelgeuse is actually is an Arabic word. It means batla, it, 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 it translates as batla jus, which means the armpit of the old man or like the giant. So that's why, so Betelgeuse, of course, is not an English word. And uh, many of the stars, for example, in the constellation of Orion have Arabic origins like Al-Nitaq, Al-Nilam, Mintaka, Regal, which means a leg or a foot. And uh, a lot of these stars and in, in that, that famous stars, bright stars that have names are actually either Greek or Arabic names. So, Betelgeuse is a, is a famous red supergiant that uh, at some point uh, during its evolution, as I said, that the envelope has puffed up. And now the core that was uh, fusing hydrogen into helium start to collapse now is even further and start burning helium into carbon and oxygen and then collapse even further and carbon and oxygen even into heavier elements and heavier elements until it reaches iron. So it creates a lot of heavier elements compared to, for example, sun-like stars, which only create heavy elements up to oxygen. But once it, re it reaches iron, the star cannot fuse more. Even if it's very heavy star, massive star, it cannot go above fusion of iron for some physical reasons. So what happens is that now we have a massive stars with no engine in the core, in the center, that is creating energy. Nothing is holding the force of gravities anymore. And what will happen is that the atmosphere of the star will collapse on the core of the star due to the forces of gravity. This, will, this atmosphere will bounce back and create a shock that will travel into the star, creating a massive explosion 
called a supernova. So a supernova explosion is actually one of the most violent explosion in the universe. And during this explosion, all the heavy elements heavier than iron, or most of the heavy elements heavier than iron are actually created. So all the elements that the heavy elements from titanium to uh, uranium to plutonium are actually made inside explosions like supernovae. Of course, there are other types of explosions in the universe that create some other types of elements, but we can say for sure that all the elements in the periodic table, heavy elements naturally created, are created during either a star explosion or of course during the fusion of elements in the star. And this also applies to the elements in our body. So our body is made uh, mostly from oxygen, carbon, some hydrogen and nitrogen and other elements. And as you saw that when the universe started with only hydrogen and helium, it was for the stars and the star explosions that all the other elements in the periodic table has been created. And therefore, after the Big Bang, and after the first stars started to form, these stars were so massive, they fused heavy elements and then they exploded. They spread these heavy elements in the universe to form new stars and new planets and new life. So when we say we are all made of stardust, it is not a cliche, it is a very accurate expression because every atom in our body comes from a star that died billions of years ago. And the atom in your right hand probably came from a different star than the ones in your left hand. This is, I think, one of the most poetic uh, things in the universe because yeah, we are made of stardust. Now, after the star goes into a supernova, the story doesn't end here, because yes, the envelope of the star is ejected during the supernova explosion, but the core, the very dense and massive core, which now is not able to fuse, as I said, iron anymore, what will do is start collapsing more under its own gravity and form what we call a neutron star. So a neutron star is a star made of mostly neutrons and neutrons are the, you know, they are one of the subatomic particles that we can find in nuclear. So we have in the nucleus, we have neutrons and protons and electrons and a neutron star because the gravity is very large some of the electrons or protons are actually merged to form neutrons. And then we have a star that is mostly formed of neutrons. They are called neutron stars and uh, they have the mass of like maybe two times or three times the mass of our sun, but it is condensed in an object that is the size of, for example, Manhattan. So it is the size of a city but we have like the mass of three suns collapse into it. So these are some of the densest objects in the universe. And if we can manage to somehow like take a teaspoon from these stars, a teaspoon from these stars will weigh like several tons. So it will be maybe the, the, the weight of the, uh, the, the Mount Everest, for example. This is how dense these stars are. Uh, again, the story doesn't end here because if the star initially uh, is even more massive, and if the core, the remnant core is more than three to four times the mass of our sun, the collapse will continue after a neutron star and it will collapse into a singularity, forming what we call a black hole. So black hole is an object that is very dense, creating around it very large gravity, where even light cannot escape. So everything that comes closer to a certain radius 
called the event horizon to this black hole, it cannot escape anymore. Even the, if this like uh, object is can traveling at the speed of light, it cannot escape the gravity of a black hole. That's why it's called a black hole because it doesn't emit light because light cannot escape its gravity. So how can we detect these objects? I'm sure a lot of people are fascinated by black holes and like to learn a lot about them. I'm happy to ask to answer questions as much as you want about black holes. I'm not going to talk a lot about them. But how do we find them? Well, black holes are found in different methods, mostly indirect methods. Uh, so one of the methods that black holes, because of the gravity, the large gravity, they distort the, uh, the space-time around them. So they warp space-time around them. And therefore, if we have a light coming from a back uh, object in the background, the light that is coming to us, you see that it is distorted by some object. And this object is the black hole. So we can see the light being curved when it reaches us because it is curved by the space time that is warped by the black hole. So another way is when we see a black hole eating a star next to it. So we see some kind of firework. We see a star being eaten. And we know that whatever is eating this star is actually a black hole. Of course, more recently, there were some really beautiful images of, of black holes that have been taken. But we're talking about supermassive black holes, not the ones that are formed from the, from the evolution of a massive star. But these are supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies. Almost uh, every large galaxy has a supermassive black hole in its center. So there is this very famous photo of the black hole in the galaxy of M87. I didn't want to put it here just to not confuse these objects with, objects with black holes that are formed from, from stars, like uh, stellar mass black holes. So if you're wondering what, what will happen to you if you get closer to a black hole, of course, what happens is that the gravity acting on your feet will be much larger than that on your head. So you turn into a spaghetti as you've been eaten by the black hole. Uh, some people laugh about it and they call it spaghettification, but uh, yeah, that's what will happen to you. So definitely you don't want to get close to a black hole. Now, to, before ending the talk, uh, if you are looking, if you are like on a, on a clear night out, uh, again, this does not happen uh, frequently in Michigan, hopefully we'll get some clear nights during the summer. But if you are out on a clear night and you're looking at the stars, uh, most of the stars that you are looking at are not actually not a single star. There are more than one star uh, uh, in a system orbiting their center of mass. So stars like our sun uh, is a minority uh, in, the, in the galaxy. Only 40% of the stars in, in the galaxy and the universe are single like our sun. Uh, the rest are either in binary systems, so two stars orbiting their center of mass, or multiple systems, three or four stars orbiting the center of mass. And uh, our eyes just cannot like uh, be, uh, cannot like resolve these these, these systems, uh, but we can resolve them with telescopes. So if you want to say like these stars have uh, Facebook profiles, for example, their relationships relationship status would be single for stars like our sun. Of course, in relationship for binary stars, and you know, for multiple systems, it would be complicated. So, uh, when we have two stars, uh, the evolution could be also a bit more interesting. So, binary stars are very interesting objects. I study them a lot, but uh, uh, sometimes, if we have two stars like our sun and a binary system. But one of them is more massive than the other. So one of them is, has mass like our sun, one of them have two times the mass of our sun. What will happen is uh, uh, one of these stars will evolve faster than the other one. So it will die faster than the other one. Because as I said, the more massive the star is, the heavier it is, the faster it burns its fuel. So if one of them turn into a white dwarf early on, the other one would be still like our sun. So we'll have a system of a white dwarf and a star like our sun. So in some cases, 
these two stars could be really close to each other, that they orbit each other in like one hour or three hours. And because of how close they are, the more massive star, which turned into white dwarf, start absorbing material from the sun-like star, from the living star. It's like cannibalizing on the living star. Absorbing material from the star, it forms like a disk around the dying star. And this star will start eat up, eating up gas and material from the, from, the, from the dying star and accumulating them. So these type of stars are really interesting to study. As I said, I enjoy studying them. But why I enjoy studying them? Because during this process, these stars might, exp uh, might experience Explodes uh, my experience violent explosions, and uh, 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 because uh, for for example a star that is eating material from 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 a neighboring star, uh, once it starts growing in mass, if it reaches a certain mass, the star will go into a massive explosion that again we call a supernova, but this is different than the supernova that is due to the collapse of a massive star. This is type of star we call type 1a supernovae. It's one of the most studied objects in the universe, but astronomers are still struggling to fully understand what is the origin of these stars or these explosions. They can be also very, very bright. Uh, here's an example of a supernova in comparison to an entire galaxy. And uh, you can see that they could outshine an entire galaxy. And as I said, such type of explosions are actually forming the elements that, that, that our bodies are made from. And when I study these stars, I feel like I'm studying my ancestors. And I hope I also convinced you that, yes, when we are talking about our ancestors, our true ancestors are the stars. Which brings me to my take home messages, which the first one is stars die indeed. And the second one is that they are our ancestors. That's a fact. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Elias. Um, mm -hmm. I agree with you, it's uh, poetic. <laughs> right. um, so we can uh, go ahead and take questions now. Um, just as a reminder, if you're joining us on Zoom, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions for Elias. Um, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, go ahead and use the comments section there to ask any questions. Um, so Elias, we did get one comment on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you wanna to respond to it. Um, Someone asked, or said rather, there is no such thing as settled science, and anyone claiming otherwise is lying to you. I'm um, wondering if you want to comment on the scientific process. Sure. I mean, definitely uh, science can change. And whatever we know now, it could be like, different in the future. But the, the nice thing about science is that it follows the scientific method. And I think the scientific method is one of the most important invention in human history. The scientific method consists of first observing a phenomenon and then coming up with a hypothesis to try to explain this phenomenon. And then we start doing some tests and collecting observations and doing tests and analysis and tests. And then once we've done enough tests and analysis, maybe we can come up was an actual explanation for this phenomenon. But before doing this, we need to share these results with our peers to see what their thoughts are about what we have done. And then there is a consensus that is reached by the scientists in this field, whether what have been proposed is correct or is feasible or not. And then after having this consensus, we can come up with an explanation. And I think this process is like very delicate and important process. And therefore, when we're talking about, for example, we are made of stardust, it's not like some hallucination or something I, I'm just saying now that, uh, yeah, it's poetic and I like it. No, this is based on decades of studies and uh, experiments and observations, analysis and more studies. 
And it is the work of thousands of astronomers and scientists uh, across, uh, uh, as I said, decades and years. So this consensus now that is reached that we are made of stardust is not, it's not based on nothing. And uh, all of these studies have followed the scientific method. And I believe that the scientific method works. It's the reason we can fly planes. It's the reason we can, it's the reason we can cure people with me medicine. Uh, it works. And uh, that's what, what, what is nice about it. So yeah, I mean, people have the, of course, the, the, the freedom to believe in whatever they want, but at least for now, based on our knowledge now, and the studies that we have now, and the experiments we have now, and the observation analysis we have now, we can say for sure that we are made of stardust. Um, I think it's important to remember. Um, so yeah, thanks for, yeah. for commenting on that. Um, so we're actually unfortunately out of time, um, mm -hmm. but I do want to ask one more question. Um, if people want to learn more about astronomy, about your research, um, where can people go to learn more? Sure. So of course, if they want to learn more about astronomy, there is a lot of uh, online uh, material that, that they can go to, but if they want to learn about what we are doing about in, 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 at MSU, uh, particularly or my, my research, I uh, invite them first to hopefully start coming to the uh, public open nights that we used to do at the campus observatory and hopefully we can resume in, in the summer so they can interact with a lot of MSU astronomers. Uh, of course, join other talks during the science festival where there might be other astronomers uh, talking about their research. Uh, we have the astronomy on tap in Lansing, which is also a nice setup. I believe yesterday there was a science festival event with astronomy on tap, where you can also meet local astronomers and chat to them and, and ask them about their research. And uh, of course, my social media handle, uh, I can post them in the comment section and people can have a look on the, I usually put a lot of scientific stuff there so they can have, have a look at that. Thanks. Um, and thanks again, everyone, for joining us tonight. I do encourage you to check out the rest of the Science Festival events we have um, going on throughout the entire month of April. So a couple weeks left. Um, we also have one more talk tonight, um, starting in, in um, 10 minutes. Um, fantastic nuclei and where to find them with Dr. Zach Constan. Um, it'll be streaming live on Facebook as well, or you can find the webinar link um, on the schedule. Um, so thanks again. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye.